I opened my galleries because I was fascinated every time I talked to an artist at the world they created, these extraordinary individual and idiosyncratic worlds. And I have enormous admiration for artists, often who they have to work in small studios with very, very little money, and yet they have this fervent desire to follow their creative desires. I searched not only the studios of London and America to find interesting individual, strongly individual artists, but I also travelled further afield, back to my native Australia, where I began in 1988 working with Australian Aboriginals. Carla Cranendonk is an artist born in the Netherlands. When she was a young teenager, she used to love frequenting the jazz clubs in Amsterdam. And it was there that she met her future husband, a jazz player from Suriname. Carla married into this African culture. She always felt much more at home in it, in the warmth of family embrace, the way the African family came together than she did in her own culture. And she had two boys and she really wanted to paint. In the evening, she would use bits of paper and paint and create these amazing patterns, many of which were inspired by African textiles and designs. And she was so excited by the colours of Africa and she herself very European. So you can see here the real enjoyment that she has with the patterning and fabrics. And indeed, she didn't stop at just painting. She actually started cutting up real fabric and collaging it to the works of art. If you look closely, you can see that she's actually sewn canvas onto the canvas. And over here, she's beaded the center of these flowers. These wonderful daisies have beautifully beaded centers. She wanted to convey the sense of strong women. She felt it was very important that women were self-determining, that they were powerful, that they were majestic. And many of her paintings are just of women, single women alone, but they may have um, some books or they may have some indication of their profession. And they stare at the viewer with pride and look magnificent. And so underneath this sort of wonderful, dazzling surface of, of colour and passion and depth is this kind of sense of completeness, of surety. I think that in this picture of Amy and Amadou, they are just completely content in this marvellous world of colour and passion and joy. The remarkable painting that you see behind me is by Clifford Possum Japaljari. Clifford was one of the great artists to emerge from the Central Australian desert painting movement, which began in the early 70s in a remote outstation called Papanya. Clifford was born in about 1930, and he began his early life as a stockman, droving cattle across the vast tracts of Australia. He then began to carve wood, and he had great facility carving wood. He made wonderful replications of snakes and lizards, and they were so lifelike and testament to his keen powers of observation. In the early 70s, a school teacher called Geoffrey Barden came to Papanya and he engaged with these wonderful old desert men and they began to tell him their stories, their myths and creation stories, and to set them down in a permanent form, no longer painted on their bodies or as huge sand mosaics, but using modern paint, acrylic on canvas. And this is one such example. The painting that you see here is called Kangaroo Dreaming. And it is important to remember that all Aboriginal art is painted as though you are a bird flying over the land looking down from an aerial perspective. These paintings are painted on the ground. Clifford and the Aboriginal artists spread the canvas on the ground and sit cross-legged, creating these vast mythopoetic landscapes. So here, once you learn to read some of the signifiers, you can get some sense of what the story is, although the cultural knowledge 
to um, be able to paint this is profound. It's complex and as, as difficult as if we knew the Iliad and the Odyssey off by heart. What you see here, this long ma, represents the tail of the kangaroo. And here you see his forearms and his little paws resting on the ground. You can see here there are two kangaroos and then another one here, another one here and one here. The U-shape represents a human being. And here you see the footprints of the ancestor as he walks along. These stories are extraordinary creation stories and they have a genesis some 50,000 years old. They explain how the beautiful landscape of Central Australia was created. And these ancestors often were human, but more often they took animal form and they could change. They could change back and forward at will. What you see here, these little stars, are actually the spinifex grasses, the tufty, spiky grasses which cover the Central Australian desert. And then this beautiful kind of um, tessellated pattern, the diagonal across the painting, represents the creek bed into which the kangaroos are resting. And these concentric circles are the Tingari holes, the place where in the dream time the ancestor emerged and wandered across the land creating it. Clifford has managed to take the main elements and to create this beautiful, beautiful shimmering surface. And really, you don't need to know anything about the genesis of the story to appreciate the formal composition of this picture. He was the only Aboriginal painter from Papania who mixed his colours, so he would mix ochres with whites and get these beautiful soft tones which he felt reflected the desert landscape from which he came. It's interesting to know that the white lines donate the sleeping kangaroo and so you know that this is a very powerful dreamtime story. The painting behind me is called The Bird by the Tiwi artist Janice Murray. The Tiwi Islands are Bathurst and Melville Island and they are huge. They are located about 80 miles north of the coast of Darwin. And the Tiwi people who inhabit them have for millennia had a reputation of being fierce. They're very proud tribal warriors. The art of the Tiwi is also quite different from the art of the Aboriginal people on the central mainland of Australia. And it's characterized by the use of ochre, which is dug from the earth, beautiful, beautiful colored ochre, and believed to be the blood of the ancestor figure. You can see in this painting that Janice has dug the ochre from Melville Island, where she lives. She has painstakingly applied it not on her body, as would have been the traditional way of painting, but upon this canvas. In Tiwi culture, um, birds are seen as the messenger between the past, between the dream time and creation, and the present. So they are very sacred things. They're, they're imbued with these powers. And in this picture, you see two jabiru, these tall, um, long-legged water birds which inhabit the top end of Australia. Janice has abstracted her traditional body paint into these really remarkable fine lines. You see here that she's drawn these, these lines freehand. Nothing has been ruled, everything is done using a brush and a simple, long, sweeping gesture. Such is her control. And these markings that you see on the legs of the birds are the traditional body paint markings that Tiwi people put all over their bodies and their implements during a ceremony. There's something so engaging and endearing and indeed charming about this picture. And yet, at the same time, it's very powerful and otherworldly. And then, almost as a counterpoint, this, um, these little dots and circles almost look like Morse code or some sort of computer 
algorithm. And yet it's interesting to think that this is one of the oldest continuous art forms in the world. The Tiwi have been painting using ochre for tens of thousands of years. Some people say up to 50,000 years. On this side, again, the lines are solid and not broken up, which gives this very dense grid. However, as a counterpoint, on this bird, the lines are broken up and have this kind of shimmering effect, which echoes this. And so this ancestral figure, I think, is one bird in two different modes. The use of white ochre, this very, very subtle white bands that she's put across the body of the bird, just slightly creating this strange diffusion. Really, really powerful, strong painting. Often, as an artist paints these pictures, they sing the creation story into them. The youngest artist I have selected for the LA Art Show City Gallery Virtual Programme is the British artist Lawrence Jones. Despite the obvious accomplishment of this painting, Lawrence has just turned 30. He is prodigious. He has never been to Los Angeles, but like so many of us, through movies and books, it's become this kind of mythic place and he has used the LA landscape as the basis for his work. You see here this modernist house. He uses photographs of a famous Los Angeles artist and he then extrapolates from them. He will then use, create a sense of mystery of what's going to happen. This sense of foreboding, of romance, it's a classic L.A. feeling that we see in all the crime noir novels and films. Also with Lawrence, the perfection of his work, these sort of rigid geometric lines, absolutely everything is divided into shapes, squares, rectangles, oblongs, and these straight lines. And he uses them as a counterpoint to the natural world. And here you see the nature, just the tops of the trees, just in the shadow, blowing in perhaps a wind, and nature is encroaching on the man-made landscape. Always, always these questions left unanswered that makes Lawrence's work so intriguing. And of course this amazing sulfuric sky um, leading up into the beautiful blue Los Angeles sky. In art, when you see a swimming pool, uh, these days one always thinks of the greatest exponent of painting swimming pools, and that is David Hockney. Lawrence's pools are very, very different from David Hockney's, whereas David's are decorative with swirly um, arabesque lines. Lawrence's are very austere, very rigid, very calm and quiet, and with a sense of anticipation. At first you think this foreground is grey, but you start looking and you see those pale grey shading to violet to darker grey, and then this is echoed in the sort of abstraction of the city lights twinkling in the dusk. As a young artist, it's astonishing to find um, such technical accomplishment. Um, Lawrence handles oil paint with virtuosity and the subtlety of his colours and the way he builds up the paint in layers and layers with glazes is really, um, to a degree, well beyond someone of his years painting. Masuka de Pazzo is a Spanish artist. She is the mother of seven children, five boys and two girls. They're still young children and notwithstanding the arduous nature of bringing up seven children, she has found time to create the most magnificent paintings, one of which you see behind me. Her work is often painted at night when the children have gone to bed, and her energy is such that she's able to do that. She stays up all night creating the paintings, um, moving in her studio, cutting up paper, mixing paint, creating these extraordinary shapes and abstract patterns, and then putting them together um, to make these marvellous still lives.
In order to find the fabrics and papers that she uses in her work, she travels the world and looks for interesting things that other people would throw away. However, on one of her travels in Indonesia, she decided to move to Bali. So she uprooted the whole family and they all moved to Bali. Well, it was a really interesting move artistically. Removed from the galleries of Europe, she suddenly found herself looking at plants, organic forms, amazing flowers, extraordinary trees, and beautiful textiles and fabrics. And she started incorporating these in her paintings. And indeed, this pink frame, this pink wooden frame that you can see around the painting, is actually the window of a Balinese house. There is something endlessly creative about Masuka. She is always so full of ideas and pushing and pushing her work in so many directions. Masuka has managed to imbue the simple still life with a sort of energy and vitality that is almost akin to the energy and vitality of a Matisse, just this sense of wonder in a simple object, in this case, a pink posh and a red posh. But there is that joy in life, that joy in colour, um, which I think characterises the best in art.